Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for listening in on this interview. My name is Lance Mosier. I'm the author of Transformed, A Spiritual Journey, and I have with me Cameron Forrester. He is the narrator of the audiobook that is due to come out sometime this week, next week, sometime this month. We're not really sure, but hello, Cameron. Hi, Lance. Thanks. Wow. Thank you so much for being willing uh, to, to let me peg you with a bunch of questions. <laughs> of course. Of course. It's a pleasure. All right. And now, for anyone who can hear background noise, I apologize for that. It is raining like crazy here. Uh, and so when I say that I've got Cameron with me, that is just through the magic of the Internet. He is on the other side of the world. I am in Porirua, New Zealand, under the wet rain, uh, though it's the end of our summer. What about you, Cameron? Where are you? Uh, in Ohio currently and wrapping up winter here. All right. I love that our seasons are swapped because yeah. my dad, when he's in Michigan, he sends me photos of the snow and I can send him photos of the beach and rub it in a little bit. Yeah, I can't imagine. He must be jealous. Yeah, he is. But then, of course, he can do the same to me. Now, we don't get the snow he does, but right. gets, when we're hunkered down in the cold. Around, sounds like. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you again for being willing uh, to do this interview. And, and just so we can um, get to know you a little bit, uh, what is it that drives you? What do you do with your free time? Uh, what's something about you that we should know? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, in terms of free time, I tend to be a little bit of an obsessive nerd. I, I play a lot of board games with my friends, uh, with my partner. She and I are big board game players. Um, outside of that, a lot of reading, that kind of thing. Camping whenever I can, although obviously not too much recent with the cold. Um, outside of audiobook stuff, I do a lot of uh, teaching. I teach several sort of drama camps in the area. So that keeps me pretty busy. Uh, but when I do find some free time, yeah, I tend to you know play some games and that kind of stuff. That's wonderful. You know, I, I know you on the professional level. You and I have uh, been working together since November on this audiobook. Uh, but now that I get to know you a little bit more personally, I feel like we could uh, we could enjoy hanging out with each other if <laughs> I ever find myself in Ohio. I love board games. Dominion and Munchkin are my favorite. I know oh. those aren't board games or card games, but I love them. Absolutely. Yeah, Munchkin's a favorite. I love Munchkin as well. That's great. <laughs> Yeah, and then uh, I love camping as well. In fact, uh, two nights ago, my, my son Silas and I, we were in the backyard with the tent up. We didn't go very far. We, we called it a staycation, but we stayed in the tent. <laughs> Great. All right. So what was it in your life that got you interested in audiobooks? Um, I think it's a, a little bit of a... Uh... I, you know, I've always been, since a very early age, interested in acting, uh, in theater specifically, um, and have kind of gotten this, not weird, but this compliment through a lot of my life. People just commented, well, you have a great voice. Uh, you should do something with that one day. And then um, throughout my career, at a couple different points, uh, I met other performers who mentioned getting into audiobooks through ACX. Uh, and I sort of had it in the back of my mind for a long time uh, and then decided to go back to school and go to grad school and sort of, you know, decided to start learning some skills to move toward it there. And then once I graduated, sort of finally felt like I was at a good time to, you know, make the investment to move toward it and to start taking it seriously and, you know, really started looking into the site and trying to make moves around it then. Well, that's beautiful. I'm glad to see that it was kind of a progression because that that's kind of how a lot of our lives play out, uh, people who are listening now and even me, that uh, you didn't say 10 years ago you sat down and had this as your lifelong <laughs> dream. It was a progression toward this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Um, and for those listening, he said ACX. I haven't uh, made that clear through my website or the Facebook page or anything, but ACX is the platform on which I met Cameron. Uh, we, I, I was looking to have this book produced as an audio book, and ACX is owned by Audible, and uh, it is kind of a, a community of, of professionals, of writers and voice producers, where they can get together and talk about how to produce an audio book together. So that's how I met Cameron. Mm, yep. Right. So it's estimated and uh, that 44% of people in the United States have listened to at least one audiobook. And I wanted to ask you, how does that compare to your personal experience? <laughs> it's, it's funny. I'm, 
relatively new uh, to audiobook listening. Uh, I've been a big podcast person, and I'm very into um, a couple of like fiction podcasts and that kind of thing, which I think are very closely related. Um, most of my audiobook listening tends to be uh, with my father. Uh, if we're on road trips or something like that, uh, mm. we really get into it there. Uh, and he, in particular, uh, is really into it. I think maybe some of my interests sort of sparked actually from listening to him and how much he enjoyed them. Um, so it's something that I'm sort of breaking into myself as a consumer. Uh, I think maybe now that I've sort of finished with this one, I have a, just a bit more time for a second. <laughs> I can hopefully find some things I like. All right. I love audiobooks. I think that I listen to probably five to ten times more audiobooks than I actually read. And wow. I think it's a, it's a time thing. Uh, you know, I've got a young family and we're busy with a lot of work and I've got uh, multiple hats that I wear throughout the week. So when I'm commuting or when I'm exercising and, and just a couple of weeks ago, my family was on a road trip. So those are perfect opportunities for me to consume a book. Um, and so that's my experience. And and why do you think that audiobooks are so popular or becoming more popular? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, like when I, I used to live in New York uh, for several years, and I think especially in those environments, I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned commuting. Um, mm -hmm. I just think it's a wonderful way to be doing something when you're commuting or when you have time like that, that doesn't feel um, obligatory. You know, like you're not just listening to the radio and you're not having to listen to commercials or something you can you can really choose how to use your time and how to you know take in a story that you really think is valuable or educate yourself further or something um yeah. so i just think it's a great way for people to to take advantage of the time they have and be more active in those moments Certainly. Anybody who knows me knows I love music. And, and I've got a music catalog that could fill a library, uh, literally, if you put it into a CD format. But, um, but I, I get something out of listening to a, a story or an educational thing, even podcasts or, or audio books. And I feel like I'm not wasting time. Now, listening to music, I guess, isn't wasting time, but you get something more out of it. And I feel educated or, or inspired to go do something uh, when listening to an audiobook. Absolutely. Now, uh, you have completed your task with Transformed, and I, I can't imagine the uh, feeling it felt when I sent you uh, the approved video showing that <laughs> I had approved your work completely. Uh, and... You celebrated in your own way, I'm sure. Now, before you even started Transformed, how many audiobooks had you done before? Uh, this is uh, Transformed is is actually my first audiobook project. I had uh, dabbled in a few voice efforts before, uh, but Transform was the first official project I had taken under my belt. So it was very exciting for me. I think anybody who listens to the book won't believe you, but. <laughs> But I'm glad to hear that. You did a tremendous <laughs> job. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it, it did come after um, hours and hours of, of research and, and obsessively combing the Internet and listening to uh, other samples from people doing audiobooks and looking through forums for advice and a lot, a lot of trial and error you know, with auditioning. So while I hadn't recorded an official book, I, I might have, you know, auditioned a book's worth <laughs> by that time. So hopefully, you know, a little practice there, but yeah, I, I, you know, I was very pleased. It was definitely a learning experience. Wonderful. And I think that's why you and I work so well together is because we do our research and even if it's our first endeavor, we want to make sure we're putting out our best. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, at first, a lot of people might think that recording an audiobook is as simple as sitting in front of a microphone and <laughs> reading. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts about that assumption? Not, I, I wish, I wish. If anyone knows how to do it that way, please uh, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> so what helps you, uh, or, or what do people need to know to kind of break that assumption down to help people understand what recording an audiobook is all about? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think recording an audiobook is so often about thinking everything is fine, that you have everything set up, and then realizing that you don't, and, and that you may not even immediately know why. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's such a, a trial and error involved, um, and, I, and I think it's, uh, I don't know, there's, there's, there's so much that goes into creating any moment when one can sit down and record, you know, even just 
finding quiet time in your home, uh, you know, scheduling mm. things out when you think the, the traffic outside uh, might not be too great. I mean, there's definitely some people recording in, you know, soundproof studios, uh, but for people who are recording on their own and mastering it theirself, um, there is a lot of effort that goes into just creating the environment to be able to record um, and a lot of care that goes into that. Okay. So when you get ready to record then, what are some of the things that you have to do to prepare before you even press record, before you open your mouth? Sure, sure. Uh, I mean, it's be, I, I sort of have a bit of a, a morning ritual in that it, usually I like to uh, start to record relatively early in the day. So I will, uh, you know, not eat too heavy a breakfast. Actually, I, I try to avoid caffeine and things that uh, will create extra mouth noises, as they're called. Um, <laughs> there's a, a, a bit of a home remedy kind of old wives tale that you can eat uh, green apples before you record and that it mm -hmm. will sort of cut down on the noises your mouth makes. And I, you know, all of those things that I can get my hands on, I do. Um, but in addition to that, there's some warming up, uh, some vocal exercises. And then, you know, almost a, a bit of, uh, you know, not meditation per se, but just like sort of a, a bit of quiet time to sort of relax. Um, yeah. Strange, even though you're in your own home, there is a nervousness to sitting down in front of a microphone. Suddenly it feels like you're you know, doing something um, special that, that can make you nervous in a way. So I sort of warm myself up and then calm myself down uh, and make sure my computer's set up correctly. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot at stake, I suppose, when, you, when you're about to hit record. And you've got, a lot, of, you've got a, a lot of things to consider, like especially, and I, you didn't tell me this, but I kind of pictured some of the longer chapters toward the end of the book that you didn't just do that in one session. Um, yeah. There's one chapter that's over 40 minutes long, and that might not even be the longest one. Uh, and I imagine that would have been hard to do in one session. So if you're stopping in the middle of a chapter and then coming back the next day or the next week, uh, you've got to consider how to match your voice to how it was before so that the reader or the, the listener has no idea that there was a break in time there. It just moves the story forward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I actually have a... Um... A sound file uh, that I keep that is just samples of every character in the book, even if they're a, a smaller character, you know, that might come back later or something like that. So that when I sit down, I can sort of refresh my memory and go back and bring up a character's uh, recording and, and sort of see what I was doing there. Or like you mentioned, I might, you know, play back a bit of audio if I did stop so I can sort of get the, the feel or the emotional quality of, of where I was at and hopefully try and match that uh, in the new recording. Yeah, brilliant. I think that's a great idea, being organized and have that reference file. Yeah. Yeah. So how did your background and your study in acting help you with this project? Oh, um, you know, <laughs> in a lot of ways, um, a lot of the voice training that I did uh, in, in both my undergrad and my graduate training, you know, led up toward this. In particular, um, my graduate experience a lot of vocal training that was around uh, being able to, um, I guess, maintain uh, clarity, but then also um, assume, you know, say you needed a new dialect or a new accent for a book uh, like this one, for example, to be able to kind of develop the skills to go and research that and, and incorporate it. Um, and I think that was led a lot to me sort of having the confidence to tackle something like this and to think about different characters and to, you know, acquire new voices for people. Yeah. And, and you did great with the accents. Um, you, you represented Devin as someone from Texas, which he was. And, mm. and I, I remember preparing you for this project. I mentioned Mick and Bob were, were kind of like landlocked surfers. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And you did a great job with them and then differentiating between them and, and even guys that were like them, like Kemp. And then you had the uh, strong presence of Pastor John. And then you had Luke, the boss. Uh, and then you had Lance, the, the primary narrator and, and the voice in almost every conversation. So you did a great job, I think, going from accent to accent. Now, Thank here's a clear. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> How many accents would you say uh, are in your belt that you feel comfortable with? Um, 
You know, I, I think just sort of off the bat, you know, say I was at an audition and, and someone asked for something, um, probably three or four, uh, you know, like a, a couple variations on a, a basic British dialect, maybe a bit of Irish and then, you know, Southern um, as a as a basic thing there. I'm I'm from the South originally. I'm from North Carolina. So, I, you know, I think there's a lot of characters in this book, the, the past you mentioned that, you know, I, I think I encountered people similar in my life um, and and sort of had touch points for uh, remembering people that might sound a certain way um, from a certain area. I mean, I'm from North Carolina, so, you know, Tennessee being close there, I sort of had a, a starting point um, for mapping some of that out. And as you go through the book, you've got to have these conversations with people of different accents, for instance, Devin and Lance, especially toward the end of the book. Um, now, for me, I would find it difficult uh, going from one accent to the other without uh, stopping or slowing down. But at least as as you listen to the book, you don't do that. You, you're able to carry this dialect uh, or dialogue and change from accent to accent. Was that really as seamless as it sounds? <laughs> um, I think it, it was definitely a skill that took some time for me to develop. I think that a lot of times I would do something like try and leave a bit of a pause in between characters that you know maybe I could shorten later in editing if I needed to. But I, I think a big part of that really was sort of, again, trying to um, get myself to a point where I could sort of remain calm enough or, or keep my breathing steady enough where I could just take a second after a character and then sort of remind myself about the new character. Mm. Uh, I would also do things like uh, I use a, an annotation uh, application to highlight uh, different character speech in the book as I do preparation so that I have a, a visual cue as well for new yeah. characters coming up. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, now that I'm thinking about it, I I picture, I don't know if this is true, but I picture maybe the more difficult moments of recording is in The Recluse when Lance, Devin, and Katie are all together discussing things. And not only that, but they're studying the Bible. And so you've got you've got five different voices to do. You've got Devin's, and then you've got the female, Katie. Then you've got Lance's voice, and then you've got the narrator's voice whenever it says he said or she said or describes something in the room. And then you've got your more reverent voice that you use whenever you read the Bible. And uh, you just go back and forth and back and forth from all of these five different voices, and you did tremendous. Thank you. Yeah, it definitely wasn't easy as, at, at first, but uh, I think <laughs> I sort of got used to it as I went on. So preparing then, uh, before the warm-ups, before the green apples and, and setting up your studio, you had to read this book. And um, first of all, make sure that you really are ready to take on this, this task. But um, I, I have heard of some audiobook narrators who don't read the book before they hit record and, and they like – uh, they feel like the reactions and the voices are more natural when they're coming out of a person for the first time. But uh, I, you and I probably agree that that's not very wise, and that probably makes a lot longer of work. Absolutely. I, I really – I don't know how <laughs> – I don't know how, how people are doing that. Yeah. No. Maybe if you're a paid professional and you're paid by the hour, that makes a lot of sense because, you know, uh, <laughs> you'll get paid more if it takes you three times, four times as long. But for you in your preparation, um, how did you go about reading this book differently than one that you're just reading for pleasure or reading for knowledge? Yeah. Um, I, I think that in particular, and, and this is uh, you know sort of a holdover just from general acting training, is is trying to go through and imagine um, you know a point of view for the narrator or for a given character. You know, uh, what is this person's point of view on what they're describing, and what uh, intention might they have with the listener? Um, I think that's one of the biggest things that I would sort of look for and maybe try to mark when I, when I had opinions on it as I was reading to prepare, um, is just sort of figuring out, you know, who these people are and, and how they feel about, uh, what's happening around them. Yeah. And, and just like an author, uh, as he sits down to write, he's got the reader in mind. And, and in this case, you've got the listener in mind. Mm. Well, um, in a few moments, I'd like to give a sample of the audiobook so that listeners of the interview can kind of know exactly what we're talking about. But before we do, a few more questions. Um, what is it about this job that surprised you? Um, I, you know, 
I, we've kind of touched on it a few times already, so I, I don't want to be <laughs> redundant, but the, the amount of attention to detail and the amount of time that went into it. I think I was, you know, assuming to put a lot of it in there. Uh, and then the amount of time that it ended up taking uh, was sort of a, a wonderful surprise. It was great to be able to really sink my teeth into something that way. I think on the flip side of that, I was surprised at uh, how much of a rabbit hole there can kind of be when, when you're trying to be a perfectionist about your own work. Um, and I was surprised at how often, you know, I needed to kind of tell myself to, to take a step back and maybe let someone else listen to it and, you know, see if, if they heard what I heard or, you know, something like that. So I was surprised at maybe how obsessive <laughs> it's easy to become <laughs> when you're working on something like this. Yeah, you and I both had to consult uh, extra ears every now and then to make sure that we're on the right path. Yes. Yeah, for sure. You, you even mentioned that we, we owe these people uh, something for for putting them through that. Right. We should give them a shout out in the credits. Yeah. Well, um, so these surprises and these things that you encountered and learned from, uh, do you think they prepared you for future work? I do. I do. Yeah, I, I feel... Uh, much more confident about it. And, it. and it has been such a pleasure uh, working with you, Lance. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of people who um, maybe their first time around, they, uh, you know, are working with someone who doesn't have the level of care or who isn't as communicative. And I, I was very lucky to have someone who obviously is really has an attention to detail with their work and really has a lot of care about their project and the way they're communicating about it. So, you know, as I learned, I had someone who was, you know, learning with me and being very uh, graceful about that. Whereas I think a lot of people maybe have a, a tough first experience and, uh, you know, hope, you know, hope maybe have a sour taste in their mouth in the future after that. Wow. Well, that, that really means a lot. And I think it, it really comes from the ultimate goal of this project is, um, you know, a lot of authors, they enjoy, uh, getting a bit of fame or maybe a bit of money and, and the book sales and everything. And sure, those things can be nice to anybody, but, but the ultimate goal in this project, and even in 2013, when I sat down to my computer for the first time to write this, it was to change lives and to open people's eyes to a new perspective, an, an eternal one. And so maybe that is related to why uh, I cared for this project so much from the beginning, and that it was important to me that it was important to you that we do a good job on this together. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, in producing this audiobook, uh, I can, I can picture an answer you would say to this question. But uh, what was the hardest part of producing this audiobook? Um, I, for me, it, it, I think the sort of what you were mentioning when you talked about long chapters. Um, I think there is an endurance required for this kind of performance that you know, I had not encountered in my life, even doing stuff like, you know, Shakespeare in the park or, you know, out, outdoor performance or something. There's something to be said for continuously speaking for that long. Uh, you know, that 40 minute chapter is going to translate into several hours of mm. time in front of a microphone. Uh, and I think that I really tested my skills in terms of just how much endurance I have to be able to focus, you know, for that extent and for uh, performing for that long. All right. Well, it makes me feel better. I was afraid you were going to say that the hardest part was uh, the time that I sent you about 80 or 90 revisions that we had to work on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, in a way, I was very helpful because, it, I mean, that was a, a learning moment in itself that I, you know, I might think, oh, I've listened to this thing three times now. I've caught everything. And it, it is really great in a way to have another person to just be there as a safeguard. I would, I would much rather have that than have something get produced and later come back to it and realize that I let things slip through my fingers. Yeah. Well, um, the first edition of this book was self-published mm. and, and I, I felt quite accomplished, but a month later, uh, someone helped me out by pointing 25 typos to me <laughs> and my heart sank. And I realized, you know, I should have paid more attention and not only that I should have paid an editor. And so uh, when it was finally published by World Video Bible School, um, we, we took care of those 25 typos, and then we found out uh, uh, 13 more were still hiding. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then finally, um, I, I did pay an editor to dig deep into this, and he came back with, with like 50 pages of suggestions, uh, and they were all good. I don't feel 
angry or upset about those at all because they were good. They were helpful. And now I feel like this this book is the best it could possibly be. And I wanted to make sure that was out of the way before I approached any audiobook producer. And so um, now that I've gone through that experience with the text, I realized from the very beginning of turning this into an audiobook that I want to make sure that when we put this on the digital shelf, that nobody's coming back at us saying, now you need to fix this, you need to fix this, that we can say that we did the very best we can, and there's no pulling this from the shelf for revision. It's done, and we're happy with it. Absolutely. Yeah, I appreciate the effort. <laughs> <laughs> and even if it cost us a lot of time, I think it was worth it in the end. Me too. Good. Thank you. Now, the endurance and sitting down to record for several hours to produce a 40-minute chapter. Um, this book clocks in just over six hours. And, of course, I've, I've listened to audiobooks that are 40 hours long, especially fantasy ones. And, and The Lord of the Rings, that was one. And right. I couldn't imagine. And back then, uh, when when the narrator, I can't remember his name, but in the early 90s when he did The Lord of the Rings, he didn't have the technology we have today. Yeah. So just for this six plus hour audiobook, how many hours do you think it took for you to produce it? Oh, um, I I think I'm probably clocking in somewhere in the early 40s. Um, I one of you know, unfortunately, organization is not always my best skill, and I, I couldn't always remind myself to record or to you know notate work that I was doing. Um, but based on what I do have, I, I think roughly around 42 hours is what I'm aware of. Okay. That is pretty good. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, you and I, we both turned out research that says maybe eight to 10 hours per finished hour yeah. is what to expect. Um, and so hopefully the next one you do will be a little less than that as well, but uh, well done. But hopefully also the listeners can give a greater appreciation of what it takes to record an audiobook, 40 to 50 hours to record just six hours of audio. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hopefully I don't sound like it's my 50th hour, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, and even toward the end of the book, you sound just as good and as peppy as, as you need to at, <laughs> as the beginning. Great, great. All right, well, um, we'll go ahead and pause here and give the listeners a little bit of a sample of the audiobook now. Chapter 21, The Biblical Body. Monday, July 28th. 2003, Henderson, Tennessee. Devin and I were scheduled to come in at the same time the following day. When we arrived to clock in, Jeanette, the manager on duty, told us, everyone needs to read the new notice before work today. Devin and I walked over to the board. There was a photocopy from the employee handbook with some highlights. The highlighted text read, this establishment is determined to provide its employees with an atmosphere that does not discriminate on the basis of gender, nationality, age, or religion. The word religion was underlined three times. A handwritten note was made under the highlighted text. Any employee who does not follow this policy is subject to a write-up and or termination. Surely that's not referring to us, is it? Devin asked me. I'm pretty sure it is, and I think I know why, I responded. I told Tina about our Bible study last week. I told her what you showed me, and she didn't seem too happy. I also told her that we had another study planned for this evening. That's still on, right? Sure is, but where are we going to do it now? Devin asked. We'll have to do it after work someplace else, I guess. Would that be too late for you? Two facts about me should be able to answer that question, Devin said. I'm still a bachelor living on my own, and I'm a college student. What do you think? I chuckled. I'll call my friend Katie. She lives nearby. She's a night owl, too. So, what did Tina say? Devin asked, going back to our previous discussion. Well, she gave me a very serious warning about studying with you. Again, she didn't seem happy. That's why I think this all has to do with us. Who else here could be making anyone else uncomfortable about religion? I pointed to the emphasized word on the paper before us. I suppose we're the only ones, huh? Devin said. What did Tina warn you about? She said that your church is a cult, and you think you're the only ones going to heaven. Is that true? Devin looked stunned and hurt. As for your first question, no, we're not a cult. I suppose you'll have to judge that for yourself, though, 
Regarding your second question, do you think the Bible can help us with that? I suppose so, Devin, I responded, trying to react with emotion, too. Look, I know you don't like telling me much without a Bible in your hand, but can you be straightforward with me on this one? It seems too narrow-minded for me to accept. I stopped trying to hide my frustration. First, I don't believe you even have to go to church to get to heaven. Secondly, who has the nerve to claim exclusive rights to heaven? There's no way you or I could ever come to a conversation like this without bringing a lot of baggage with us, Devin began with observable control over his cool. This is obviously important to you, and I think the answer to that question brings meaning to everything you and I have discussed in the past and will discuss in the future. I know you've had a lot of experiences with religious people, and you yourself have admitted that none of them have satisfied you by showing you clear answers in the Bible. Now, are you seriously asking me to do the same and answer you right here on the spot? You know very well what I want to do. I see your point, I said, thoughtfully. I know you just want to show me what the Bible says. Who am I to deny you that? I'm very excited that you, my friend, are interested in Bible answers to your excellent questions. I'm serious about finding these answers with you. I'm serious too, I said. Devin continued, Then I think the proper question you should be asking is, Who are you to deny yourself this opportunity? Devin paused, apparently giving me the opportunity to protest. I didn't. He was absolutely right. All right, we hope you enjoyed that sample, the beginning of chapter 21. And if you haven't read the book or if you haven't listened to the audiobook, which you haven't at this point because it's not released, I hope it kind of whets your appetite uh, for the rest of the story. Um, Now, uh, for those who are listening, um, I'd like to say something because they they don't know who you are, Cameron, and they want to know where you came from. Uh, And and I'm not talking about Ohio or South Carolina or – or anything like that, just where you came from in my life. Uh, Because I've worked closely with professionals in the creative industry, and many of whom share my faith and convictions. I know people in the film industry that I would go to church with. I know people in the audio industry and people who are on tour with with rock bands and so on. Um, Now, I know you know, but I don't think all of our listeners know that instead of finding someone who was already familiar with Transformed and already believes what I believe— I decided to reach out to an unknown professional, and I'd like to ask you, as someone who was not out there looking for this story or a journey of faith, um, but you were approached by the author, how did the story of Transformed affect you personally? Oh, Um, I think I was very affected by uh, sort of the message of uh, self-determination that I, that I think runs through the book of people not uh, of people sort of examining why they may believe what they believe and sort of uh, putting their thoughts to a test uh, of you know seeking out evidence um, and seeing if after examining evidence they still feel the same way they felt uh, I think that, was really resonant for me. And I think it's uh, an important message uh, in a lot of areas of our life right now. Hmm. I suppose if if there's any message I'd like to get across with that story, it's that. It's it's okay to believe things, but not just because you've heard it or not just because people you trust believe it too. You've got to figure it out yourself and keep seeking that evidence. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Now, um, that was a little bit deep. Uh, On on the lighter side... (laughs) Since you're an actor, and and I dabbled in acting a little bit, I enjoyed drama class in high school, and and at one point I even pictured myself being an actor. I did some in university, and and I was begged uh, to try out or to audition for Dracula uh, by the director herself, but I was too busy with work at the time, and so you know I still have this dream in the back of my mind, which I know will never happen. That maybe one day I could act as well. But since you're an actor, uh, I've got to ask, can you do any good impressions of famous people? <laughs> I don't, Lance, oh, no, I, I might have to disappoint you on this one. I don't know that I can't. I'm, I'm really bad 
at impressions in particular. A lot of times when I tell people I'm an actor, they ask me if I've done, if I like, uh, you know, improvisation or if I like to take improv classes or do improv comedy. And I'm actually really bad at imp- at uh, impersonations. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, <laughs> your reaction at least is worth asking that question. <laughs> I love improv comedy. Uh, the best performance I ever went to on the stage was an improv theater, and they did such a good job. And it was at a, a Christian-based uh, university, so so they did it all clean, and it was beautiful, and I was rolling in the floor the whole time. It was wonderful. Sounds great. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm sorry for our listeners that uh, Cameron can't <laughs> deliver on this one. I was hoping for, I don't know, Christopher Walken or Jack Nicholson or one of those. Well, we'll just put one in in post. We can just yeah. ask somebody else to do an impression. Or you can work on it and we can do interview part two. Yeah, right, yeah, for a bonus. Now, speaking of, of impersonations or accents, uh, you mentioned you're, pre- you're pretty comfortable with a southern accent and, and a basic British and maybe Irish, I think you said. Um, I've been living in New Zealand for over six years, nearly seven now, and I still can't get the Kiwi accent. You know, I I listen to New Zealanders all day long, um, but there's something about their voice and and the way they say certain words that I just cannot impersonate. Yeah. It's very very interesting. Yeah, and and I don't don't really, I expected to detect it uh, in your voice when we first talked, and I don't hear it. Yeah, you've kind of not, not picked it up. Yeah, and uh, people have noted that. Uh, now, my mother and other people in my life say that I've I've lost something of, of whatever I was using as an accent in the states. But mm. I don't think, yeah, and, and my wording of things. You know, I talk about rubbish and I talk about the boot of the car and things like that, the footpath instead of the sidewalk. But right, as right. Far, as far as accents go, no. But my son, who's nearly five, um, people have noticed, and and he goes to um, a preschool that he's surrounded by Kiwi kids and Kiwi teachers. So he's starting to pick it up a little bit. Oh, nice. Um, now, speaking of accents and voices, you you once told me that you are a bit self-conscious about uh, doing female voices. Uh, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think that it's that is still something that um, I'm sort of figuring out and, and exploring on my own as I get into audio books. Um, is that idea of different characters in a book, and particularly uh, if you're a male speaker voicing someone who's a female speaker, there's a, a fine line between, uh, I guess, caricature and just a, a slight adjustment. Um, yeah. No, please. Yeah, I think so. And and I feel like any one of us would be self-conscious trying to impose or, or to, to pretend to be a different gender uh, with our voices on the microphone, for sure. Um and when I was doing my research as well, uh, some of the coaches for audiobook narration say that uh, less is more in this area because if you, you know, as a male, if you start speaking like this, then yeah, people sure. will call your bluff and they'll get distracted more than they'll be immersed into the story. Yeah. And, uh, and if I may say again, you did a great job with the females in the story. Um, it's not like you change uh, the the octave of your voice or anything. It's just and, and and the softness of your voice when you're doing the females. I think you communicate that well and you don't distract the listener at all. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Well, just a, a few more questions. Uh, are there any current uh, any projects you're currently working on that you're able to tell us about? Uh, The thing that's taking up most of my time right now is uh, I'm in a production of Romeo and Juliet with a university here who needed a guest artist. And then I'm helping uh, a bunch of middle schoolers right now write their own play. And and that uh, of the two is actually becoming the the more demanding thing. Uh, But I really enjoy that type of work. Uh, So both of those are, are currently in my mind. And then once they wrap up, I hope to put some more time into audiobooks again and, and start auditioning in that realm. All right. Well, you know, Romeo and Juliet is certainly a noble production and you'll do well, I'm sure. But but I feel like, you know, once these preschoolers do what they're doing and they finish what they're doing, uh, you'll feel a bit more rewarded with that project. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, that's a lot of the work that I do is um, – you know, as a teaching artist is working with younger kids and helping them, you know, write and then, you know, act in 
uh, their own productions. And it, it really is a, a fantastic process to, to be a part of. Well, you've invested so much of your education in acting, and, and you're obviously involved in stage work. And uh, you mentioned earlier that you're working with a costume shop, and, and yeah. you mentioned to me personally, not in the interview. Yeah. And you're helping these preschoolers, and this is all stuff about um, physical production of of plays or, or maybe even later movies. So if, if you've invested all this time in, in personal acting, uh, what would you say your future in audiobooks looks like? Um, I hope to make audiobooks a regular part of my life and of my performances. I think that one of the things that can that is so tough for for people that are trying to get into a, a life in theater is initially when you're starting out finding ways to supplement your income. And I think that a lot of people burn out because they are you know working jobs that, that they don't care about, uh, mm -hmm. and I think that through a combination of things like teaching and working on audiobooks, uh, I really hope to even if I may not be on the stage in a given moment, or maybe I'm not doing a play every single day of the year. Uh, this is just a wonderful way to be telling a story in another you know in another way, uh, and I find it to be really rewarding. So it, it really is a focus of mine, and I hope it's something I can continue to develop. Well, great. And I hope you'll let me know whenever anything that you've worked on is about to come out, because I certainly want to listen to your voice tell another story someday. Of course, of course. Will do. Thank you so much. And, and the last question that I had noted that I'd like to ask is, um, out, out of the past, I don't know how many months, six months almost, uh, we've been working on this together. What would you say is the most rewarding or most enjoyable part of all of this? I think, uh, you know, I, I don't want to just default to say when I was finished is like, ooh, it's over. But, uh, you know, looking back on it, this has been such a unique experience for me, again, because of the time. I think it was, what, uh, October, November uh, that, I, that we started on this. And to look back on a project like that, I mean, of course, you rehearse a play for a long time, but there's so many people and you go through so many different stages that it often doesn't feel like just doing one thing for that time. And to invest the amount of time in a project like this that was, you know, basically just one person working at it little bit by little bit for months um, to then be able to look back on it. You know, it really it seems to me the way that someone must feel when they build a skyscraper or something that like, you, know, you just bit by bit uh, built this giant thing. Um, and I think that that was a, a really unique feeling. Yeah, I, I can only imagine. Now, with a skyscraper, you can step back and you, you can look at it. And, <laughs> right. and you can even go to the other side of the river and see it as part of the skyline. Yeah. Uh, with a play, when you finish the production, you, you join your fellow cast members. Uh, you join hands and you take a bow and the crowd stands up and tells you how much they loved it. They throw a rose at you and you can take that home as a trophy. And then with an audio book, when it's finished, you've got 500 megabytes of files on your computer, <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. In fact, uh, this job's been done for three weeks now, and um, it's still not even available for people to download and listen to. So I hope, and, and I don't think it, it is the case, but I hope the lack of rows or the lack of skyline is not discouraging you yet. Uh, in a matter of days, I think we'll start to see people's impression, and I, I hope they really enjoy the work that you, especially, that we have together uh, put into this, because I think I think it'll be worthwhile. Me too. Me too. I'm, I'm very excited for it. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening to this interview, uh, and thank you, Cameron, for being with us. Of course. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, uh until we discuss again for perhaps another project, I hope you have a great day. Thank you so much, Cameron. Thank you, Lance. See ya.